exciting times. Love being here. This is like my favorite time of the year. I love the cold. I'm from Latin America. People think I like the warm, but I don't. I actually like the cold. And uh, got invited to go to uh, swimming in the Baltic tomorrow, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm also, the, I have the privilege of being Tom's colleague. So if you were here, raise your hand if you're here for Tom's talk. Great, it's a very tough act to follow. I really love him and his content's amazing. I'm the prequel. Think about the Star Wars movies. He made three, four, and five. I'm one, two, and three. Hopefully I'll be better than George Lucas's rendition. So one of the things that I want to get a sense from the audience is how many of you are actively fundraising. So just a show of hands. Excellent. So the most of you, which is good. How many of you are raising your first round? Okay, so I would say this, this talk is probably targeted to you guys. If you're raising a Series D, this is probably not for you. So feel free to go and mingle somewhere else. The reason why I was asked to give this talk, I think a little bit is partially on the tail end of, of the book, which I wrote um, about four years ago, and then I republished this year with updated view. And the reason why I updated it is for many reasons. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that on the, X, on the term sheet, it says X, as opposed to a number. When I originally published the book, I put a number, which was typical for seed. But what we're seeing now is how fast those rounds are growing. People's expectations of round sizes at the pre-seed and seed stages have like doubled in just one year. So a lot is changing. And what I want to do in this chat is give you a sense for what to, what to like reflect on in the lead up to your first round. So that's what we do. Now a little bit about my story. Um, as, the, as the introducing team said, I was an engineer. I uh, worked in tech, I worked at New York Stock Exchange, and then I moved into um, the world of venture because I loved it. I love tech, I love meeting founders, I love what people are building. And over my career, I've, I've been part of the journey of 400 companies. I have a pretty good sample size, and I really specialize in that first year. That first year of your journey that's what Tom and I and the rest of the Seed Camp team has been seeing for over 13 years. And I wrote the book because I saw how hard it is. You know, the, the process of fundraising is probably one of the most frustrating experiences. And I know this personally because I've had to raise for Seed Camp. Seed Camp's a startup like you guys. Our first fund was 2.5, our second one was five, our third one is 20. And yes, we have some winners in the, in the family of Seed Camp, but it didn't come easy. I mean, we've had people turn us down for investment, we've had uh, term sheets pulled from us. We've had every single story. I won't say them on stage, but if you grab me later, maybe I'm willing to share some stories. But I can, trust me when I tell you, I can feel and understand. But I will say that fundraising has also been one of the most inspiring, insightful, and serendipitous events in my life. I've learned from so many people during fundraising. I've gotten, I remember one chat that I was having with my colleague Reshma where we were fundraising and we got asked a question by an investor and neither of us knew the answer. And it's, it's really great when you go fundraising, you have your co-founder there because it's easier to, to sort of, you know, trade off of each other. And we were like, do you know the answer? No, I don't. Do you know the answer? No. I and so like later we looked it up. We're like, shit, next time, let's not get caught out on this. So we came up with an answer and we'll talk a little bit about that. How many of you are here for Ted Person's talk? Raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. There will be some overlap, don't worry, but we'll hopefully cover some new stuff. So the first thing is... Um, do I need to raise? Now, why would I put this when all of you just raised your hand saying, do I need to raise? It's because I'm seeing more and more companies that can self-fund. Especially if you're issuing some sort of crypto token or you're doing anything in Bitcoin, you can probably generate enough capital. You don't need to go through a venture program of any sort. And I mean venture program, I mean include funds and everything. Also, sometimes you need to think about what it is that you, you get into with a relationship with an investor. You might not realize that when you're taking money from an investor, like it's got implications. And those implications are both positive, but also they do put you in a certain track. I mean, just to give you an idea of what I mean by shareholder alignment, can I realistically return at least 10 times their money? Like if you're building something and you honestly think your company's probably worth 50 to 100 million, maybe 200 million, you can get rich but can an investor get rich too? And unfortunately, that's the nature of the venture business. And I know it sounds like a basic question, but you'd be surprised. A lot of people are in the business of building businesses that are cash flow positive and can do very well, but they don't, haven't fully thought through, is this a venture backable business? And if it isn't, don't worry about it. You can make enough money on your own. Now, the second 
thing, and I should probably put it in another reverse order, but personal alignment. You really need to invest in researching who you are as a person because so much of who you are as a person will be transformed when you're building a company. And I can tell you this from first, first-hand experience. I remember some of the worst mistakes I made maybe uh, seven years ago as a leader within the Seed Camp team, helping manage our team members and making all sorts of HR mistakes, like things that you learn. And, and so first of all, the first question you need to ask yourself is, do you see yourself as a leader? Do you want to be investing in yourself? Because that's what you need to be willing to do. If you're not willing to invest in yourself, and what I mean by that is like, actively thinking about how can I be a better human being for those around me that I have the responsibility of leading because you need to not only fundraise for the company, but you need to hire their best people, inspire them, keep them motivated, deal with their problems and own their problems. It's your problems to take care of. It's not anybody else's. And so if you're driven by other externalities like your ego or what you want to achieve, it ain't, it ain't the thing to do. This is not the right, there's other ways to make money. This isn't the way to do it. So think about what is the ambition for your business? Is it externally led or is it internal? Those are really key things so that you know. And then the last point is what is your ideal outcome? I think early, early days, maybe about 10 years ago in the venture world, I would hear investors say how European founders aren't ambitious enough. That's bullshit. We all know that's bullshit. But the reason I think they were saying that was because they had a couple of anecdotes about how founders sold too early. I don't care whether you sell early or late, it doesn't really matter, but I think what really matters is that you fully understand what it is that success means to you. I remember when um, I was in, my, in school back in the day, one of our professors told the entire group of people, said, hey guys, write down everything you want. Just write it down, he said, write a list. And so everybody's writing down, you know, uh, plastic surgery, yacht, whatever, you know, you write it down. Pretty much everyone said, something around $100,000 to $200,000 covered all their wishes. You know, maybe a bigger house, okay, fine, add a million. A million, a hundred, a million, two hundred. You quickly realize that in order for you to achieve the material or other things that you think you want, doesn't take a billion dollar company. But I'll tell you what comes with a billion dollar company. Responsibilities, shareholder meetings, investors, expectations. If you go out public, you've got public uh, issues and you have a team of at least 300 people, all that need your attention, your inspiration, your management. So those are all things that you need to consider. This is the journey and the responsibility that I'm embarking on as a leader of a venture-backed company. So the next point is the fundraising mindset. Now, the reason why I say all these things is because if you believe all those things that I was saying earlier, the way that you will present yourself to a venture investor will be fundamentally different. My job is to invest in people. I can tell you right now, I can tell, so can Tom, so can Ted, other investors who spend a lot of time, you guys too, you can tell when somebody's driven for the right reasons and that inspires because you know what your job is as CEOs? Hiring other people, raising money. So if you can't do that, if you can't convince me of that, how can I believe that you can convince others? That's the tricky thing. So about fundraising, the whole process is a series of iterations. I can give you a whole bunch of magic formulas, doesn't matter. If, if I sat here and I told you exactly how I raised for seed camp, it wouldn't be applicable to you. I think one of the biggest mistakes you can do is compare yourself to somebody else on TechCrunch. Oh, you know, we've invested in some great stories and I'm sure those founders, you, you've read their interviews on TechCrunch or Medium or Sifted or any of the great publications out there. What you realize is you're not like them. Like when we fundraised for seed camp, we struggled raising we had our first fund, it was 2.5 million. Our second fund was twice as big, 5 million. It was hard. People said, this shit will never work. Why do you have so many companies? Why are you too big, you know, too small, too many fees? Always some issue with how we were raising. And, and if we looked at some of our other friends who were raising funds, we were like, fuck man, why are we not, uh, man, why is it so hard for us, right? Don't compare yourself to others. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, don't think any rejection as failure. Think of it as an evolution. Because with evolution, you will end up with achievement. Some of the best stories are about continuously evolving to the point where you get to where you want to get to. One of my favorite stories, and I talk about it in the book, is one of our founders, who I'm not going to say his name because I don't know that he wants me to share it, but you can read it in the book, um, is uh, he, he went 
to a meeting, which was his 80th meeting, or 76, high enough. He had been rejected by everyone. He had about five euros left in his bank account. Flies to this guy's office in Germany, shows up to the office, is in the, in the lobby, and then all of a sudden, the, the EA says, uh, sorry, uh, forgot your, uh, your, the meeting. Uh, wasn't in the schedule. Whoops. And he's like, fuck me. I've come all this way. This guy, anyway, the investor says, look, really sorry about that. I'm going to the airport. Get in the car. Let's go. Gets in the car, goes, pitches him, gets his anchor investor. The rest is history. You just never know. You never know. Another one of our founders sitting in the tube in London, starts talking to a stranger next door, boom, ends up being an investor. You just never know. And it's happened to us. Like I've had amazing conversations with people, people who have ended up being our investors. And the thing is that you need to be open-minded about this. You need to be thinking every single interaction I'm going to have here outside with me in the party, every single interaction is a possible lead to the next person who's going to invest. And as long as you embrace that, you'll always have authentic engagements with people which can lead to a possible fundraising element. Because at the end of the day, this is a relationship business. That's all this is. So, you will find the right person at the right time. You cannot control the events that get you there. You can only control your reaction and be resilient with any feedback you get. So now let's go into the bit that's maybe a little bit of overlap with Ted's talk. Storytelling. So much of what you need to do in fundraising is just get what you're doing correct. It's that simple, but it's also that hard. For example, raising as a seed fund, um, one of the things that came up often was, how do you compare to this other fund? Or how do you compare to this other fund? Or I've already invested in this seed fund in Europe. I don't need to invest in you because I already have exposure to the seed market. I'm giving you personal anecdotes for what it feels like for us to fundraise, even though I, I appreciate many of you aren't raising funds, but it's, it feels very similar. And what, what we realized very quickly is when we're presenting anything, you have to be able to present things, how they're different from anything out there. There's a really good book called Positioning, and it's written by an author called Jack Trout. And what he talks about is how do you get people to think about you different in their minds? We're not talking about like an X, Y axis. It's an emotional engagement. How do people emotionally connect with what you're doing in a way that they've carved out a niche in their heads for you. So that's the first thing. And storytelling is just how do you package that and get it out the door? But positioning is how do you make sure that when they receive it, they know how to compare it relative to something else. The rest of the points are pretty obvious. You need to set the right milestones. What do you want to achieve with it? How much money do you want to raise? And do you have a plan on how to spend it, which is the financial plan and all that stuff, right? Now, on how much you want to raise, one of the things that you probably are seeing today is the increase in valuations. I'll give you a very, very fast mathematical tip. The equation is very simple. How much money you're raising divided by the dilution equals the post money valuation, right? Pretty simple math. So I'm just going to help you prioritize your negotiations here. The dilution is something that the industry of venture has kind of stabilized around. Nobody wants to own 50% of your company. Nobody wants to own 0% of your company. So focus on how much money you want to raise. And to some extent, you will find that most investors are going to offer you something between 10% to 20% dilution, which will give you a range for valuation. The point of this isn't to give you a lesson on valuation. The point of this is you control your valuation with how much you raise. That's the biggest variable because it's a simple equation, three variables. Pick one. The other one is kind of market driven. You have the outcome for the third. Simple enough, right? Now, the reason is, the reason why it's a little bit more complicated is because you can't just pick a random number. You can't say, I want to raise 10 million, although you're hearing about it more and more. But the point is, you get to choose your valuation to some extent by how much you're raising and try to calibrate for what you've seen others do in your sector, in your space, what is the right first round to raise. On average, pre seed to seed, somewhere between let's say 500 on the smaller end to about 3 million on the upper higher end, but not the highest, right? There's always going to be outliers. But anyway, those are just rough numbers for you to think about. The next part is pretty simple. The materials. I mean, I know this is basic, super basic, but I, when you're an investor and you're receiving tons of emails, try to optimize. This is a hack, right? Try to optimize for how do I get their attention without overwhelming? 
This is super simple. First of all, optimize everything you send for mobile consumption. Secondly, don't send an email that's this long. Try to think about your email as something that can be viewed without scrolling. And have everything be so that people can automatically engage with it without having to over, like, don't log in, do that extra. Now, the, I've seen a lot more founders do doc send. It's pretty cool for a couple of reasons. You can see who saw your presentation, how long they saw it for, um, who they shared it with, and that's all great. And I don't discourage that. But what I'm saying is find a, a balance between having a high barrier for consumption and or being like super, like track everything. But both work. The last points on the, on the materials is make sure you have a cap table that's readable and understandable. And try to, when you talk to investors, try to front load any issues you have with your cap table. Because one of the biggest problems everybody has is if you've had some historical thing that happened to you that isn't great, you know what? Front load that. Actually, for anything, if you have anything that's gone wrong in your company, front load that at the right time, right? You don't, it's like when you go and you meet somebody new, a romantic partner, you don't just immediately go into all the bad things about your life, right? You first find some charisma, some charm, some connection, and then you kind of, you know, you have to tell a story. Did your co-founder leave? Well, you know, just share that at the appropriate time. Don't wait for that to come up at the very last minute to jeopardize your, your round. If you have um, founders that have left or investors that are you know, not actively involved, yeah, maybe you find the right time. The point is, all these things add up to your fundraising materials and you want to get those done right. The next bit is the human element. This is the bit that I think Ted spoke about quite a bit and I'm not going to go into too much detail. But the human element is reaching out to the right investors. How many of you have cold called an investor? Okay. How many of you cold called an investor? I'm not going to look. Just raise your hands. I won't look without actually checking to see if their stage and their sector of interest was in alignment with you. Okay. Um, the reality is it's, a, it's an easy sin to commit. You do a mail merge, off you go. It's so easy, but you know what? It's so deadly because you build yourself an unfortunate reputation of spraying and praying and investors talk and they'll be like, oh, this doesn't look right. Why would he send? And I get, so in our, I, in our fund, our fund's name is Seed Camp. I mean, it's written there. And I get an occasional email that says, we're raising a series B. I'm like, dude, come on. It's written on the thing. Why would you send me a series B? Don't do that. That's an example of totally, completely not identifying the right investor. So make sure you identify the right investor, get an intro. I think Ted spoke about this. Get an intro, get the right references. It's, it's going to do wonders for your introduction. Even from another friend. Look, everyone here is probably sitting next to somebody else that is connected to the right people they need to connect to. Make friends and go through those friends. If you don't have any friends, grab a beer and make a friend. Okay, it's that simple. So in terms of choosing the investor, it's about relationships. It is so much about relationships. This business is a relationship business. You want to find somebody that you can work with for a decade, at least, because that's how long it takes. You know, we invested in TransferWise in 2010, I think, and I'm friends with Tavit. Actually, I go to him for personal advice, and he might be around here somewhere right now, but, you know, he's a great friend, and, I've, I've, and, and I cherish that. And, you know, I hope he cherishes that too. And, and the same for Johnny from Hoppin. Same thing. You know, like, you want that kind of relationship because at the end of the day, you're going to build that. Now, Doug Leone from Sequoia says, I don't want to be your friend, but we might become friends during our work time working together. And that's fair too. Fair too. So either be, be, some, be with somebody that you think you can be friends with or be with somebody you respect so that you can potentially become friends with. But if they're an asshole or dick, just because they're giving you money, I wouldn't take it. And there's people that I wouldn't want to work with. So about managing your pipeline, I don't want to go into too much detail because it was covered in a couple of the previous presentations. I wrote a blog post about this, and I, I am going to be that guy who says, check out my blog. I wrote it. The cool thing is, I promise you will get out of value out of it because there is an Excel sheet you can download, and literally all you have to do is fill it in. But basically, the summary of the blog post is, think of fundraising as a pipeline, like your sales pipeline. And as I was talking about, it's an iterative process. So you just fill out the names, who you, who you spoke with, when you, did, when you spoke to them last, what's the next thing you need to do, and then over time that will materialize into hopefully an investment. The, 
this is a summary of what we've just been good through. It's a, it's a circular, as you can see, circular process. You identify the right investors. You move into your first draft of materials. You take those interesting meetings. You analyze those. You fine tune those materials. And then you go back to identifying new investors. And you can do one or two or three of these, and then you'll tweak it. So when we fundraise, and by the way, if you want to look at Seedcamp's pitch deck, because fair enough, you guys share it with us, so we share it with you. If you go to SlideShare and Google Seedcamp pitch deck, you'll see our previous fund and the fund before that. We went through multiple iterations. We'd go pitch, make a mistake, fix it. Oh, shit, we didn't add this person, fix that. Oh, oh, we should describe this, or the numbers weren't right, fix that. Grammatical mistake, we all make those, fix that. And so, you know, you want to do that. You don't want to do that forever, but you want to, like, maybe two or three meetings, you'll figure out what the issues are, and you start fine-tuning. Another thing that's really helpful, and it's, it's, it's here in analysis from the first meeting, is if you can go in with your co-founder or with somebody from your team and you present, one of you kind of mentally keep track of the eyes of the investor and see where your story isn't quite connecting. You can kind of tell from people when they're disconnecting, and you can be like, ah, this isn't quite working. Like, for example, this gentleman here getting up, I'm like, shit, I don't know what I said, but I lost him, you know? So it's the same kind of thing. You know, you're just kind of like, ah, oh, man, what could I have said? Uh, series B, he left. Um, so think about this as a circular process. And lastly, closing the deal. There's only two things that really drive this, FOMO and metrics. Really only two things. You're either generating FOMO because you're doing something or you have the metrics to show. And I have seen both versions of this. Um, one, one of our investments is Revolut. And uh, I love Nikolai, the founder of Revolut. He's, he's a great guy, and I know that you, know, you might have opinions about him or not. But one of the things I really admire about him is that he's been shipping product very fast. He's always been super, super fast about how they ship product. And one of the interesting things was that early days, when he would present to investors, he's just, you know, if you've ever seen him speak, he's not like, you know, he doesn't like that, but what he does, he, he backs up everything he says. And I just remember early days, he would just talk about his numbers, and it was just like, wow. Like, how they're growing, how they're doing. And if you have that kind of story, tell it. It's amazing. You know, like, it, it delivers. Now, sometimes, especially at the early stages, you don't have that. Fine. Which then leads us to FOMO. Okay, so what generates FOMO? The right storytelling, the right team, all those elements that we were talking about earlier, that's what generates FOMO. So how else can you generate FOMO? Well, you heard Tom talking about um, when you have competitive term sheets, that, that helps. That involves having one or two more investors. Another thing that generates FOMO is being at the right place at the right time. And this is part of being a founder. It's like, okay, what part of my business is relevant for this investor right now? Why am I the right business right now? Why am I the right team right now? And how can I tell that story in a compelling way where people are like, shit, if I'm not part of this, I will miss out. Now, if you can have both those things, that's amazing. And that's how stuff gets done. So with that, guys, thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure being here. I'll be around if you guys want to chat. But thanks again.